things off, though, with Jamie Jenkins, independent statistician and political commentator, formerly, of course, from the Office of National Statistics. Jamie, very good morning to you. Good morning, Mark. You think we need to start a campaign to get you uh, asking some of the questions of these briefings? I think Robert, Pe- Robert Peston's already asking for more uh, restrictions. I mean, I don't understand why they keep asking such useless questions. I mean, you know, you had already said yesterday um, that you didn't believe the number, the 7,000 number. Nobody seems to bother asking about where it's coming from. No, well, maybe we start with our 7,000 number, Mike. So it comes again from another one of these models being used by people linked in, in with the SAGE crew. Now, I've looked at the paper. One of the things the paper does point out, it says it's possible, but extremely unlikely. Yeah. But it's that number then is turned up on the front of the Guardian this morning. And, and, and it's just it's just shambolic, really, to be honest, Mike. So let me just break it down. Now, yes. The, the maximum we saw in January was 4,000 hospitalizations a day. And that's England only. So the numbers we're talking about are England only. Yeah. And what that came from, Mike, was about 69,000 cases a week before. Because remember, there's always that lag. You get, it was actually the peak of cases the week before that peak in hospitalizations because you get a little five day lag or something before people go into hospital. So, what we know, though, is the vaccines do reduce hospitalizations. People can go on my Twitter feed, I update the kind of the figures there. Estimated probably, Mike, around 80%. So, remember back in January when we had this 4,000, hardly anybody had been vaccinated. So, if you just do some basic math, this isn't, you know, this isn't a kind of rocket science degree right. level math. Just, just kind of a bit of a news, a bit of paper and a little bit of a calculator. It's quite easy to work out. To get 7,000 admissions a day now, based on the current numbers, you'd need in the next month over 300,000 cases a day in England. Now, they're hovering around 20,000 a day. Uh, so where is it going to get 300,000 per day in the next month? It's just unfeasible. I just can't see how this has made itself onto the, the front of the national newspaper. Now, what's the problem with that? Most people, Mike, will not, well, hardly anybody will be reading this age paper. There'll be people who obviously pick up the Guardian, who'll be picking that up and start thinking, oh, we, we yeah, need But I mean, even, even uh, sort of journalism 101, Jamie, the beginning of the story, right, the first sentence, between 2,000 and 7,000 people a day could be hospitalised with COVID in England next month. I mean, that's a big area, 2,000 or 7,000. So it could be three times bigger than they're saying, uh, or more <laughs> than three times bigger, uh, or it might not be anything at all. I mean, it's not even a story. No, exactly that, Mike. And and all obviously all this is stemming from the government's winter plan. And obviously there's a lot of things we could probably talk about today. So I've actually read the winter plan. I've spent a little time looking at it. And I suppose the one thing for me, because plan A, just for, for the kind of the viewers and the listeners, is carry on as we are with what we currently go, where we have the boosters for the over 50s and um, we'll vaccinate children. And so and then it, it goes on in paragraph 71, Mike. And this is the kind of the critical number, the critical paragraph. It says if plan A is not uh, sufficient to prevent unsustainable pressure on the NHS and further measures are requ- uh, then further measures will be required so that's not the government's preferred outcome but it's a plausible outcome that must be prepared for so if we go back a few years like a lot of people can't remember pre-covid or pre-brexit you go back to winter 2018 yeah. BBC headline tens of thousands of non-urgent NHS operations and procedure in England may be deferred due to winter pressures uh, the Guardian was talking about the same time the, the year after that thousands of NHS staff have quit because of Brexit. Every single year, the NHS has unsustainable pressure that it cannot cope with. So when it says in this winter plan, if we get to that point, we may have to bring in plan B, which is things such as vaccine passports, masks, uh, people working from home. It's inevitable, Mike. I can't see how you are not going to have a, a winter where the NHS can't cope. Well, it seems as though they haven't had a winter where they can cope for about 20 or 30 years, but except for the fact that they always do cope. They always manage it. I mean, we were told that uh, the NHS was going to be overwhelmed in January, which was, at, as you've pointed out, the height of the pandemic. And it never was overwhelmed. We got through that, Mike. Yeah, and actually, if I, I tracked the numbers there, and we actually saw more people in hospital after January when you look at all causes, not just people in hospital with COVID, in the spring, because as, as we've discussed in the past, there is that significant number of people who aren't coming forward or haven't come forward over the last year that started coming forward. And we've already, in you know, I, I see the, the, the news quite closely in Wales. I'm sure it's the same in England. We've already got health boards cancelling operations, saying to people, don't come to accident and emergency unless it's an emergency. Well, I'm sure people aren't just rocking up. But then it all brings back in the problems about people go to see their, can't get to see their GP. So they're going to the NHS with regards to that. So, so for me, Mike, uh, we we talked about 
what Boris has been talking about and Sajid Javi about vaccine passports this week as well. Mm. I think there's some tactics going on here. You know, I've worked within kind of the civil service and the government and they, they kind of said, well, we're not going to bring it in, but we'll reserve the right to do it. I can just imagine there'll be a press conference in about six or seven weeks time. Cases may start rising as because when people mix more indoors as the weather gets a bit colder, the cases probably will rise, I would imagine, Mike. And they'll probably then say, oh, well, to avoid a national lockdown, we're going to be really nice to you by only bringing in vaccine passports. Yes. And it's going to be seen as a kind of a, 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 a kind of a But the trouble is, of... for me, Jamie, there seems to be a kind of um, corresponding and completely diametrically opposed narrative going on, or two different narratives. One is um, that we need to get as many people vaccinated as possible. The second one is um, that we need to vaccinate children in order to get more people vaccinated. The third one uh, is, unfortunately, the vaccinations aren't enough. So we need to actually get um, you to... Stay home as well if you can. Uh, wear a mask if you can, because the vaccines are not enough. And then you'll have to get a third booster jab vaccine as well. You know, they, they all the same. All of those things can't be right. They don't. They don't meld with one another. No, and the, and the data, Mike. Now we we're, because the vaccine rollout probably started ramping up at the start of the year. There were the trials to look at how effective the vaccines are, and we got real data now. So we it's quite clear when you look at the data that. It's reducing hospitalizations in relation to cases by about 80%. It's reducing deaths by about 90%. They've been creeping up. But, you know, cases have been quite high through the summer because mm. of this Delta variant. So the vaccines are working. But to get these extreme numbers, which will mean that we're going to get hot, perhaps new restrictions coming, would suggest that the vaccines won't work. Well, you can't have both sides of the coin, Mike. You no. know, we, we, we remember we were told, get the vaccine rollout to the vulnerable. You know, and, you, and you've talked about this in the past. Then you got roll out and roll out. And then let's look at the children thing then, Mike. So I, I, there's going to be a lot of parents out there thinking, you know, should I get my child vaccinated or not? So I've been looking at the data on this. So if we look at people who are aged up to 15, looking at the ONS, the most serious outcome, obviously, is a sad death. We've had 19 deaths among children linked to COVID over the course of the pandemic. So that's 19. 19. But 19 overall. But the majority of those, Mike, sadly, uh, they are sad deaths, will be linked to pre-existing medical conditions. Mm -hmm. Now, we're already vaccinating children with regards to that. Now, that 19 deaths, let's put that into context. So the 19 deaths is out of a total number of 145,000. Yeah. So it's 0.01%. And then some people forget sometimes, especially among elderly people, sadly, people die every single day. So of the 19 deaths that we've seen since the start of the pandemic, there's sadly been 4,800 children who have died of mm. other causes since the start of the pandemic. So right. from a... From a serious outcome perspective, it's very low risk. Now, what people then start throwing in, Mike, is long COVID. So we've had a recent study that's kind of suggested that long COVID is not as bad as what it was kind of thought of well, in the past. Well, long COVID so has not even been properly defined, has it? Because um, apparently if you are, say, for example, um, somebody who's had COVID and it's three months later since you recovered, but you still don't quite have all of your taste and smell sensations back, you're suffering from long COVID which might not be an issue for you as a health problem at all. And this is where the problem comes in, Mike, because the study that looked at kind of long COVID, it was tracking kind of children uh, and looking at them three months later yeah. and just looking at the symptoms. And, and then one of the issues for long COVID, Mike, is there's so many symptoms. It's easy to com can kind of confuse long COVID with, say, mental health issues because there's a lot of commonality, fatigue, you know, muscle aches and pains. There's a lot of crossover lap between them. Right. Now, what the study came up with is they said that potentially between 2 and 14% of people in the study had symptoms three months later. Ministers are going around now saying, and, and people who are obviously a big kind of fan of trying to vaccinate children and just trying to kind of have more lockdowns are saying that one in seven children will get long COVID. They don't say that was a study three months later. They, they kind of suggest in the mm. way the narrative is talked as if long COVID's for life. Well, I don't think that's the case. And the reason they say between 2 and 14%, Mike, is... It could be as, as low as one in 50 because, for example, if he was in the study and you had no symptoms, you probably the, the response rate was quite low. So they probably dropped out of the study. But the, the problem, more, it more... seems to me, Jamie, in our current climate is that basically people issue these uh, headline figures, you know, like one in seven children are suffering from long COVID as if it's true. But it's not true. And they can't prove no. that it's true either. Exactly that, Mike. And say it could have been as low as one in 50, but people will jump on the highest number, yeah. a bit like this 7,000 hospitalizations a day, which is pretty sensational. And, but the, I think the most important thing, Mike, is the same study tracked children who didn't test positive for COVID, and many of those children had symptoms as well. 
because they are just general in the population. Mm. So you can't say that this is long COVID, yet yeah, they tested positive for COVID, they got symptoms. But many children who never tested positive didn't have that. So, so in terms of risks of death, Mike, it's very low. In terms of risk from long COVID, it looks relatively low as well. And then it comes into, okay, the, the JCVI have said the medical benefits didn't outweigh kind of the risks. So the parents have then been told that the chief medical officers are going to advise on this. So what have they done, Mike? They've looked at the educational aspect. Now, this is the critical quote, I think, from one of the articles that I read on this, is that they said it was not possible to quantify with any confidence uh, to what extent vaccinating children would reduce school disruption. Mm. So there's no evidence on that outside of things. And then they've thrown mental health in. Now, for me, if you're a child and say your parent wants you to be vaccinated and you don't, or vice versa, your parent doesn't want you to be vaccinated and you do, and all the peer pressure with children, that's going to have a huge impact on, on mm. mental health of children as well. So so why put all that extra burden on things yes. when there doesn't seem to be strong evidence? I, I think it? a lot of people are going to find out that that was a step too far because I was listening um, to uh, one of the union leaders talking to Julie Harley Brewer this morning about the school situation. And schools are basically taking the view, as far as he was concerned, that they are not doing what they were doing before with the testing regime, which is that the school was kind of a, actively helping kids to take tests and actively encouraging kids to take tests. This time, with the vaccines, they're going to be saying, we're basically giving a haul to the people who are coming down from the NHS to vaccinate children if the children want to be vaccinated, but they're not going to be allowing them to do something against their parents' wishes, and they're certainly not going to be encouraging children to get vaccinated. So I think this is a very different situation. It might backfire uh, on Mr Whitty, who's ashamed, apparently, of uh, people who uh, are going around peddling myths like Nicki Minaj. He says she should be ashamed of herself, but he's not ashamed to go against the policy of the JCVI, which is not to vaccinate children. Exactly that, Mike. And and what I don't understand with this kind of policy, and now in Scotland, they've said they're going to get children to vaccinate in the community. In Wales, they've said majority of it will be in the community. Some will be in schools. I personally think, Mike, and I think you've been talking about this on the show, there's no reason to go into schools because that adds that extra pressure because right. it might be, oh, little Johnny, my mate's not having the vaccine and, and it might feel then, oh, maybe the parents have not the vaccine or not. And I don't think you can think that, that parents who don't want their child to have a vaccine haven't had the vaccine themselves. These are two entirely different Absolutely things. Absolutely right. You know, and I mean, profile. we heard from a caller yesterday who rang in from Bristol to say that her son's at an FE college and he uh, was sitting in the canteen and this nurse appeared out of nowhere going around all the tables asking kids if they wanted to be vaccinated. And that is definitely a breach i would say of somebody's privacy it's a breach of uh, any kind of data protection rules that you want to think about it's certainly a breach uh, of what the school should be allowing to happen yeah and, and it's not on mike and, and, and i suppose you know some people will say that parents who don't want their children to be vaccinated are anti-vaxxers that's not the case you no. know there's the vaccines clearly do work when you're looking at the, the broader data for the general population in particular the elderly people but there's lim limited evidence for children and the more important distinction here mike is that you know, they get vaccinated for the flu. We do know that the flu is more deadly for children than COVID ever has been mm. since the start of the pandemic. So there's a rationale for doing that. The flu vaccine, yes, but maybe the COVID vaccine. I know parents who want the vaccine. I know parents who don't want the vaccine. I think going into schools and doing it just adds that extra pressure. And it also means that the parents are probably not going to be there. If the parent goes with the child to a community area, that's more or better to do it. And, and the more important thing, Mike, is Cases have been relatively high in children mm. since the start of the pandemic. So if you really want to roll this out and get informed consent properly, why don't they test the child first for antibodies? If they've already got antibodies, great, don't need to have the vaccine, do that first. And then if they haven't, have the discussion with the parent and the child if you think yeah. it's perfect. And I, listen, if, if some parent wants to get their child vaccinated, I can't understand why you would, but if that's what you want to do, then take them along uh, to a vaccination centre and get them vaccinated. But I mean, I'm not doing that. And I really don't want people in my sit my children's school pushing the vaccination. Indeed, exactly that. Might, especially when, as we just, as I just said, then there'll be many children have already got antibodies because infection rates have been quite high most children though it's difficult to get exact numbers on this because one of the things you a lot of children won't know they've ever had covid because mm. they don't show the symptoms which is one of the kind of the positive things of this whole mess of the pandemic since last march is that whilst this infects children very few of them show any symptoms which means, that, and then very few of them, you know, practically zero, end up dying no, from the virus. No, and hardly yeah. any of them get particularly ill either. Stay with us, Jamie, for a second. We want to ask you a few more questions about some of this stuff. Jamie Jenkins here debunking this rubbish on the front page of The Guardian. A lot of people urging me to tear it up. 
Hmm. Maybe. We'll see. Uh, 7,000 cases a day in hospital. It's just not true. It's just not true. This is Talk Radio. Welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk Radio. I was listening to an interview, uh, Jamie, I'm talking to Jamie Jenkins here, independent statistician, former, formerly from the ONS. I was listening to an interview this morning with a social psychologist who, first of all, uh, made the first mistake by claiming to be a scientist and saying that, you know, he knew what best the government should be doing in order to make sure that we don't have a repetition of last year. And as you said, you know, the circumstances this year are completely different. You know, this time last year, uh, there was a lot of people who thought that COVID had disappeared because it apparently had. Um, um, but hardly anybody was vaccinated. In fact, nobody was vaccinated at this point last year. Now, with all these people being vaccinated, and as you say, people with with, with uh, immunity as well because they've had COVID. I mean, it's 90 odd percent, isn't it, of the country who we believe have got some kind of antibodies against this virus. And so the idea that we have to somehow start making restrictions, and you notice they've started using the word restrictions rather than any other word because it sounds like it's less bad. Um, you know, where they're telling people to work from home if they can and wear masks if they can. You know, somebody pointed out today, um, there's going to be Prime Minister's questions. The, the, the government's official line is that you should wear a mask in a crowded indoor place if you can. None of them are going to be wearing masks today in Prime Minister's questions on the Tory side, just on the Labour side. So it's got nothing to do with health, has it? No, Mike. So masks, let's, 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 the, the, the evidence on masks is pretty limited mm. now. Obviously, for some people, they want to wear a mask. They feel protected. That'll be good for their mental health. Others don't want to wear a mask. And, and if you look at the data, Mike, so England's cases peaked this summer on July the 16th. Now, miraculously, that was three days before kind of the delayed Freedom Day. Yeah. Now, in yeah. Wales and Scotland, they've been rising. They're starting now some kind of green shoots, I suppose, of recovery. They're starting in the last few days to show signs of coming down in both Wales and Scotland, mm. which starts putting in some kind of context are the schools actually this big problem that we thought they were in the past but in england cases have been relatively flat in scotland and wales they've been going up masks are more mandated in scotland and wales so you know we've got to look at the data across these different countries before jumping down that road and then i think robert peston yesterday was talking about masks now the prime minister's position on this is if you're in a, in a room with people you don't normally mix with wear a mask well robert peston's asking for masks he wasn't wearing one yesterday so, <laughs> so i mean it's you know, pathetic it's, isn't it it is. It's just bonkers, Mike. So you're right. It's over 90 percent. Actually, you've got antibodies and, and people are saying that we're in a much worse place than we are this time last year, which is why they're really worried about the winter. Now, remember, these respiratory viruses, we they they kind of they, they go around and spread. They're more likely to spread in this winter. You know, COVID shouldn't become more deadlier as a virus itself with no. the current variant that we've got in the winter than what it is now. It's just that those respiratory viruses like the flu and, and COVID, they're more likely to spread during the winter months, partly just to do with the fact that we mix indoors more and, and not outdoors mm. more. So, and we, and so cases have been really high, but with the, the chances of reinfection are relatively low as well. And we've got these huge amount of antibodies. So you, you bang on the money there, Mike. We're in a totally different place to where we were this time last year. We were going into kind of a winter. Where, and another thing that people doesn't get talked about as well is that, you know, you, you look at global pandemics from like 100 years ago. We had the big kind of flu epidemic about 100 years ago. Even without a vaccine there, these va these kind of pandemics, they do have waves. They kind of spike, spike off. And then when a lot of immunity comes into the population, they slowly diminish and, and die off over time. So so we're in a much better place vaccine wise. And I just think the default of let's bring in restrictions if we have the NHS overrun, it, you know, it's like saying is the sky blue. There's going the NHS will be overrun in terms of what the NHS is now. Yeah, but the reason overrun. the NHS gets itself into problems is because the NHS is badly run, badly managed. They've sent loads of people home because they say they've been in contact with somebody with COVID. It's still the biggest and most dangerous place to catch COVID is inside any hospital in this country. You know, not in a pub, not in a restaurant, not a football match, in a hospital because they can't even control their own germ factory. So, you know, what hope is there for the rest of us? No, exactly that, Mike. And if you look between 2010 and 20, kind of going into the pandemic, 17,000 fewer beds in England. We've got far fewer beds per person than places like France and Germany. In particular, ICU beds is going to be the critical one they're going to talk about this winter. So you can't miraculously make doctors and nurses overnight, but we've gone decades now of under kind of preparing the NHS 
you know, maybe I don't think money's specifically the issue here. It's no, of course the it management and the policy of things because it already sucks up a lot of money. The NHS, Mike, and you know, just throwing more money. You know, they're, they're raising national insurance to look at doing that. Is that going to fix the problem? You know, I, I think I've spoken before and said, you know, you need a root and branch review of all of this because. Of it's just it's just it sucks a lot of money in mike and i just think it's inevitable that they're going to use oh, the nhs we've got more and more patients going in now which we really expect to have that we're going to bring in vaccine passports masks work from home it, they say they plan b they're not what they want i think it's inevitable mike well the thing is they've already got situations in some parts of the country where hospitals are saying they're going to suspend operations uh, because more people are going in and out of the hospital with covid well why don't they just fix the problem of spreading the covid in the hospital then you can get on with the business of actually helping people making people better and giving people the operations they've been waiting around for for months and months and sometimes years well in, in wales might go uh, some of my local hospitals they've stopped patients uh, being visited by kind of their family you know, because of just about it. And you could argue that's not a bad thing if mm. it does reduce the risk of people from the community coming in and spreading it. But a remarkable story, uh, I don't know if it was kind of political point scoring or kind of a, a, kind of a gesture, was in Wales um, they donated a load of PP that was unneeded about a month ago mm. to uh, some foreign country because they said it's unneeded. Well, we've got this global pandemic. How can PP not be needed when we're telling, you know, patients can't have visitors coming in we're seeing rises in cases in hospital it just seems the the kind of the, the way things are being managed and what's actually happening in the real world mm. are two different things mike and yeah. then this week just uh, mark draper is going to announce in wales if he's going to return to any further restrictions he hasn't ruled out vaccine passports or not i can't see him doing that because people in cardiff will pop to bristol for a nightclub and i think but yeah. it's just the country just needs to, you know, grow up, get on with it. And some good news, Mark, let's probably end on some good news sure. today because we pull out doom and gloom. Is yesterday ONS figures, the number of people back on payrolls is above pre-pandemic levels. So, you know, the economy is starting to get going with yeah. Boris is allowing that. And job vacancies are record high. So, so we're starting to see some green shoots of recovery, but we don't want to damage that by going backwards and closing the economy again. Well, of course not. And we don't want to put more people out of business either. That's precisely what we don't need. Jamie, great to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. Jamie Jenkins bringing you the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth about the figures and about the nonsense and about the modelling that is done by these sage maniacs who just want to shut everything down constantly in one way, shape or form. Well, I'm not having it. Not this time. Not a second time around. No, thank you very much indeed.